Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. My guest today is Esther Cash. Esther is a junior at Biola University in California, and she's been working with Braver Angels for over a year now, first as an intern and now as a program associate focusing on Braver Angels debates. I wanted to have Esther on today because polarization is a generational problem and we are committed to engaging as many young people as possible and developing future leaders who can drive our mission in the decades and maybe even centuries beyond, who knows. And I've been wanting to have a college student on for a while to talk also about the culture of political discourse on college campuses at a time when there is a great divide in terms of free expression, safety, which topics are off limits, and how students who disagree can talk constructively without feeling like they're going to be judged or ostracized or enveloped in the toxic polarization that causes so much anxiety in so many of us. So Esther, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I feel very honored to be here. Like I said, I've only, or I've only been with Braver Angels for about a year. So already being on the podcast feels like I've made the big leagues. (laughs) Yes. Well, welcome to the big time. Tell me a little bit about your background and upbringing in terms of your first political philosophy and how you think that might have contributed to your desire to be a bridge builder and want to work on depolarization? Yeah, Um, I grew up in, in, well, obviously I'm at Biola, which is Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Um, I grew up in a religious home. Uh, My parents are pretty, we're evangelical Christians, but um, pretty traditionally conservative in terms of politics. Um, my grandparents on both sides even more so. Uh, so I grew up pretty, um, it was like faith and politics were intertwined in a very conservative, traditionally conservative way. Um, and I didn't really know exactly why I believed the things that I did. They were just kind of things that I had overheard my dad or grandparents talking about as you know right and wrong. Um, and I've always been, nuance has always been really hard for me. I've always seen the world in black and white. Um, so, you know, when you're getting fed all of those things from your parents, um, it's really easy to see the world of black and white and write people off on one side or the other. Um, and I, <laughs> I remember this story from middle school cause I was in middle school during the Obama Romney, uh, election, I think it was. Um, and I, I was in sixth grade. I had no idea what I was talking about. Um, but I got into this like argument with this girl in, we were in English class, the PE teacher was subbing, like it was, couldn't have been more uh, out of the blue, but two sixth graders were getting into a yelling match about abortion. And because that was what I heard my parents talking about like a couple nights ago. And I was like, it was my first time learning about it. And, you know, being from the sheltered home that I was, I had no opportunity of seeing the nuance or the different perspectives in that. I was just like, you're killing a baby. What the heck? Um, and so that's what I walked into school with and I got into this argument with this girl and she was yelling other things back at me and I was like I like we were in sixth grade uh, and I but I knew that she was adding nuance and perspective and I was like oh I never really like thought about those things before Um, but I didn't really start cracking into my own like political perspective until high school um like I said, I went to a math and science school and it was, but it was still in a really diverse area. Um, and it had a really good lineup of teachers that cared about social issues. And so all of those things that I had only ever talked about in the, it, at home, 
and then with middle schoolers uh, was finally being talked about by other adults um, and other peers that were, you know, like juniors and seniors had a little bit uh, more development there. And like things completely turned on their head for me. It was, you know, a four year process. And I still, I think over the pandemic went through a lot of transformations politically as well, but it was the first time I'd ever been exposed to different ideas. It was my first time hearing different ideas. Um, and it was just kind of this like high school was a time of deconstruction for me. Um, and I ended up on the left. I ended up very far left uh, compared to my family who would, um, I think my parents would consider themselves more moderate. They kind of fall either way, depending on the issue. My grandparents are very far right. Um, and nobody in my family really enjoyed that, uh, which is why I ended up at Biola. Um, I, my parents were nervous about uh, some of the other liberal arts institutions um, kind of brainwashing. Uh, so I, Biola was, you know, one of the couple of Christian options that I had for college. And I think being there actually pushed me even more to the left. Um, because when you're confronted with idea after idea after idea that you disagree with, you start to think about why you disagree and move in the opposite direction. Um, so I kind of did a full, full circle. I'm still religious. Um, but my politics looked very, very different from my family. Uh, and it did impact our relationship, um, which is one of my main reasons for joining Braver Angels was uh, politics have always been, you know, it, something that meant a lot to me. And I enjoy having conversations about that with my family. And so even after, after having done that full turn, I had to figure out how to uh, have those conversations. So, hmm. so you mentioned abortion. Um, what are some other areas where, you know, you sort of grew up hearing from your parents who you mentioned <clears throat> may have had some kind of black and white views when it comes to right and wrong and politics? And how did you then, what are the issues that then you became divergent about? Mm. Sort of tell me more about specifically how that crystallized over the course of high school and then, of course, going to a Christian university where you say you're confronted often by ideas you disagree with. Yeah. Um, immigration is a big one. Uh, I think um, like capitalism, wealth disparity, like I spent all of high school working as a I started out volunteering, um, but I was eventually hired. Uh, as a dance teacher at this children's theater company in like the heart of East LA, um, right on Pico Union. And it is a community um, filled with uh, immigrants and um, African-Americans and people who Spanish is their first language. Um, it's a community that has been heavily uh, affected by um, gangs and gentrification. And so, going down there, I grew up in like the South Bay, Los Angeles. So like by LAX kind of area. Um, so it really did pop the like South Bay, Los Angeles bubble to be working down there um, and hearing the stories of, you know, those kids and their parents. And that's really where I, I learned Spanish. Um, and that experience, I think those four years really did kind of uh, influence my opinions, not only on um, immigration and the wealth gap, but just the role of government and the role of politics. Like, again, traditional conservative, they were very like small government, small government, small government. Um, and I went down to that community and I could see uh, and, you know, hear all of the different ways that a bigger government would be helpful for them um, and has helped them in the past or, uh, you know, they wish would come back and things like that. Um, and so that experience really, I think, on in terms of like how the government should be helping and the government's role um, in the welfare of uh, its people. I think that really transformed that. And that kind of played into my stances on immigration, my stances on the economy, X, Y, and Z. And so over the past three years at college, how have you seen those differences show up? And what are the conversations you've had with some of your classmates who may subscribe to more of your parents' views? Yeah, it's hard on a campus like Biola because nobody assumes you disagree with them. Because 
the politics are so tied up in morality, which I think is not not unique to Biola. I think that's on kind of every campus you go to, but especially at a school like Biola, people don't expect you to disagree because when you disagree with them on politics, it means you disagree with them uh, religiously and you're not supposed to disagree with people religiously at Biola either. We all signed a statement of faith. You know, there are certain things that you walk in assuming people believe. And then there are these political assumptions that everyone individually has tied to that kind of statement of faith. Um, so it's like walking into a classroom and reading essays on why capitalism is the most Christian form of, you know, economic structure, whatever. Um, and nobody disagrees. Uh, and there's not even room to disagree. Like the teacher will give you that essay and then say, okay, let's talk about what the author's saying uh, and why they're saying it uh, and why it's right. And then you never see something about why socialism is the most Christian form or, you know. Um, so all of those kind of conversations one-on-one -on -one definitely happened outside of the classroom. And they happened with people who were my friends first um, and people who I felt like shared my political beliefs a little bit. Um, it wasn't until I, uh, I mean, really, it wasn't until I joined River Angels that I think I started making a bit more of an effort to connect with, um, I'm still a political science minor, so uh, making an effort to connect with those people a little bit more and hear about their experiences. Um, but like on abortion, for example, uh, like it's not, it's not an issue where I can approach it uh, in any way except like, yes, that is a life, it's morally wrong to kill, but let's look at autonomy in the United States as a whole. Like it has to be very much logic and appealing to um, like a separation of church and state uh, because for everyone on campus, again, those two are so like deeply intertwined. So my experience mm. might've been a little different. Yeah, it's so interesting because I think a lot of liberal campuses in some ways have the opposite issue mm -hmm. where so much of the dogma is focused on social justice and progressivism. And I know I went to Duke University, which is definitely a more liberal school. Uh, I wouldn't say it's as liberal as some of the other North Northeastern liberal arts colleges uh, since Duke is in the South. And there are certainly conservatives at Duke, but I know from my conversations with some current students and professors that basically since Trump got elected, professors and students alike tread lightly when it comes to political conversations. And I know, for example, that the Duke Republicans disbanded and there are certain activists on campus who don't even want to be forced to read uh, conservative positions because, as you mentioned, people see it as a, a moral issue. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I wonder if there's something we could do where we connected, you know, conservative Christian students at Biola with liberal left wing activist leaning students at you know Wesleyan or Middlebury yeah um it could be an interesting experience so you mentioned that you know it wasn't really until you joined Braver Angels that you felt more comfortable instigating and having these conversations with people who disagreed with you strongly on these you know personal raw issues what was it that you learned at Braver Angels or came to understand that you feel like equipped you and gave you the confidence to have these conversations, given that these sorts of exchanges are clearly important to you? Um, I think I avoided the conversations because um, I just didn't want to hear it. Like, I didn't care. Like, in my mind, I was like, you're not going to change my mind. I'm clearly not going to change yours. So like, what is the point of us even having this discussion? Um, and something that Braver Angels like really reminded me, and I was really taken aback. Like I wasn't, I have to admit, I wasn't expecting like anything when I joined. Like I said, you know, right off the bat reading the mission statement, it just seemed like 
uh, too good to be true, you know, very idealistic. Um, but I think Braver Angels does a really good job of reminding you that every, I don't know, every person is also an individual. Like it's really easy to like another person, but when you think about like, I, like how many days that they have lived and how many hours that they have like been present for and the amount of years that they like carry with them um, and, um, and relationships and like just thinking about how many connections and different places I'm involved and different things that affect me on a daily basis. You forget all of those things are happening to every single individual. Um, and I was reading, um, we read some Flannery O'Connor uh, this past semester uh, in the great books program I'm a part of at school. And her work, um, she was a, uh, one of the most famous American short story tellers, um, writers, and her work did kind of the same thing of like telling stories um, of somebody who is like blatantly racist, but by the end of the story, you still have compassion for them because you've seen they were like a single mother and they had to fight to raise their boy and you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, and so it was like really about remembering that people are individuals and that in the same way that I have parts of me that are um, that like not everyone would agree with, um, like you still have to, it, again, it's just not looking at people black and white. It's allowing for there to be nuance. Um, and in the same way that I would hope that people would give me grace and nuance and take the time to understand why my beliefs have formulated the way that they are, um, I have to remember to do that for other human beings and other individuals as well. Yeah, totally. I think the power of acknowledging, recognizing, and understanding other people's life experience is naturally going to breed humanization and uh, respect for individuality um, rather than simply seeing someone as the other side, which is sort of an inherently tribal yeah. perspective that really can destroy not just relationships, but the very social fabric of the United States. And mm -hmm. I think that's a thread that weaves through a lot of Braver Angels work, which is giving people an opportunity to speak directly about their own experiences and their own views in a way that's personal to them. Mm -hmm. It's not just reciting the talking points that they heard on Fox News or MSNBC and doing so in a defensive way, because I think we've all been conditioned to view political debate as, uh, you know, a kill or a kill or be killed uh, kind of dynamic. And, yeah. and when we do that, we, we don't let our guards down. And there's this sense that giving an inch or allowing for nuance is a weakness that will get mm -hmm. exploited by the person you're talking to. So can you talk a little bit about Braver Angels debates, given that you've been working on that team for a year, and given that Braver Angels debates is really where we help people talk and argue about these specific issues, abortion, immigration, gun rights, and gun control, even the 2020 election itself. What have you seen in the model and the experiences you've helped cultivate that allows for nuance and that can really be a transformational experience for people who participate? Yeah, I think, I mean, like I said at the beginning, um, the reason I, I enjoyed debate so much in high school is because I like to argue and I like to win. Uh, and neither of those are factors at Braver Angels debates or metrics of success, um, which was interesting to me because I was like, who is going to want to sign up for a debate where they don't get to win. Um, but so many people sign up and it's because people don't care about winning as much as they do about being heard and feeling as though they've been listened to. Um, and what I think a Braver Angels debate does is it creates a space where people feel like um, they're going to be heard. 
and and not in a way that is like false um like false resolution or like you know just kind of humoring people or whatever but they know that they're allowed to set the conflict on the table and everyone's going to look at it and everyone is still going to be heard um yeah i i yeah <laughs> yeah no that that makes total sense i think one thing i sometimes hear from skeptics or you know maybe people who haven't yet participated in the debate is something along the lines of well how am I supposed to debate someone whose facts are wrong? How am I supposed to debate someone when we're not even living in the same reality? How have you seen that show up? And how would you answer someone who's asking that question? See, that's hard because it's a question that I sometimes ask as well during these debates. Um, and I, I've seen it play out. Uh, you know, we just had a, a COVID debate on like vaccines a couple months ago. Um, and, you know, we had uh, licensed physicians in the room, I believe. We, I know uh, someone else on the debate team, his daughter was there, and I know she's, um, you know, a, a professional in, in the medical healthcare world. Um, and I remember there being a lot of frustration around, you know, um, the fact that she wasn't able to refute some of the misinformation that was spread by other people at the debate. And um, to me, it's hard because I have to remember that the purpose of Braver Angels is to teach people how to talk to each other. And you can't talk to each other if you think that you're living in different realities. So yeah, people have uh, different ideas of truth and different ideas of facts, and that is so hard, but we're all looking at the same conflict um, that's on the table. Or, you know, we like to think that we are, and what Braver Angels does is, um, at least in those debates, is it, it really does say, yeah, we're all looking at the same conflict. Like we all, you know, are talking about the same thing here. There is some form of shared reality at the table. Now we've just got to figure out how to allow for, you know, both perspectives on the conflict to be shared. Hmm. Yeah. And I think so much of what informs people's perception of reality and the information they believe in is what sources of information do they trust? And given how polarized our media environment has become and the incentives that govern a lot of media output, it's no surprise that people are increasingly living in different worlds where they're just consuming completely different facts. And that's not to say that there isn't uh, objective reality in terms of what transpired, say, during the 2020 election or during the events of January 6th. But it shows that, for me, the fundamental issue is one of trust. And I think mm -hmm. Braver Angels debates um, begin to foster some of that trust where people might soften up a little bit and see that, oh, I am building for trust for somebody who I disagree with. Perhaps I'll become more amenable to considering their perspective and their sources of information. Mm. And I think that's one thing that the experience will breed even if it doesn't lead to people agreeing on facts and i sympathize with what you said about the vaccine debate because i hosted a podcast with uh three guests two of whom were vaccine skeptics and one of whom was an icu doctor and it was just interesting how they're obviously operating on a completely different set of assumptions. Mm -hmm. And there's asymmetry when it comes to the credibility, you could argue, of their positions, given that the ICU doctor has, you know, advanced medical training and is also literally experiencing the reality of people with COVID mm -hmm. every day. But that doesn't mean <laughs> that the positions of the vaccine skeptics are any less legitimately felt. Mm, um, mm -hmm. 
And so it was an interesting conversation to, to bring them all together. And some interesting points of, of commonality did emerge, especially between the two vaccine skeptics, one of whom was a pretty far left activist okay. and active in Black Lives Matter, uh, and the other of whom was, uh, you know, white conservative Trump supporter. I remember the David Owinsky, who, you know, who works on the debate yeah. team, he, he was the um, you know, red represented. And gotcha. at, I think at the end of the conversation, he said something like, I can't wait to go to my gun club and tell all my buddies that I did a podcast with a Black Lives Matter activist and we agreed on 100% <laughs> of things. And of course, that's not to say that Hawk Newsom, who was the, the left-wing activist, was representing the Black Lives Matter perspective mm -hmm. on vaccines or really representing anyone but himself. But obviously they have such divergent political views and it was interesting to see sort of their overlap when it comes to their position on vaccines, mm -hmm. which I do think in some ways is fed by some misinformation, but I also think stems from kind of uh, deep suspicion that they both have yeah. toward the powers that be, toward the medical establishment. Um, you know, Hawk as a black man and black activist can point to historical examples of the medical community lying to and subjugating black Americans. And I think a lot of conservative libertarian folks see vaccines, but also vaccine mandates in particular as a violation of their individual freedom mm -hmm. and thus a infringement upon their identity, regardless of whether they think the vaccine is safe or whether they believe certain conspiracy theories about side effects or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I briefly mentioned President Trump and it's something I wanted to ask about. How have you seen President Trump affect the views of your classmates uh, who come from a more Christian conservative background? Because I know that Trump enjoys pretty intense support among evangelicals. And there's definitely folks on the left who are annoyed, shall we say, or mystified by that because they think that a lot of what Trump represents cuts against some of the fundamental tenets of Christianity, at least insofar as they're expressed by Jesus's teachings. Uh, how do you think about that? And, and how have you seen, you know, your fellow classmates and professors wrestling with that? I've seen people fall on both sides. I've seen people, well, maybe that's a lie. I haven't seen too many people disagree with Trump's policies. Um, obviously Trump wasn't super traditionally conservative with his policies, um, but I think there were some people who were super willing to say, Trump uh, is doing a great job if he would just keep that fat mouth shut. And there were some people who were willing to say, I like what Trump is doing and I like what he's saying. Um, and that comes from the same place um, of that I think maybe um, you were referencing with your two uh, vaccine skeptics of, of just a, a distrust, but also a, like, I'm sick and tired of the bureaucrats. I'm sick and tired of blah, blah, blah. Like they were very much like Trump calls people on their BS and I like that. Um, and I never really understood it. Uh, I think that um, like people do matter in politics. I think people and policy are both things that should matter. Um, but I think a lot of people who, on campus were really willing to settle for somebody who didn't quite fit their people uh, or requirements um, because it was a relief to have somebody who was read in the office after eight years of Obama for a lot of people on campus. Um, they really felt it's interesting because anywhere else you go, or at least in my experiences, um, in all of 
my other friend groups and uh, schools that I was at and anything really outside of the Biola sphere, not a lot of people are talking about religious freedom uh, and religious freedom being like threatened in America. But that is something that Biola is super, super concerned with and the Biola community is very, very concerned with. And so Trump entering um, and being very uh, unapologetically, uh, I mean, he called himself Christian. I don't really know if he is one, um, but there, he was very, very for religion uh, in the workplace, um, in the schools, all of that stuff. And he fought for a lot of religious protections. Um, and so that was kind of, they saw him as a big ally uh, for them. Yeah, definitely. And I think like a lot of communities in America, there's a lot of religious folks who feel like they are being marginalized. They see, mm -hmm. you know, a society where a lot of the elite institutions from mainstream academia to Hollywood and cultural production alienating religious conservative yeah. Americans. And I think that's understandable. And I think in Trump, they saw someone who was willing to fight for them and stand up to these forces that spark fear and anger. And I think there's uh, underneath all this polarization, sometimes uh, a feeling that, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Hmm. And I think you, you see that on the, the left as well. Yeah. So I guess my last question would be, where do you see braver angels going? And how do you think that we can spread the movement among young people? Do you think that young people are oftentimes cynical and jaded and very polarized themselves or do you see an opening for young people who feel starved of opportunities to engage with those people they disagree with but haven't necessarily found a space where they feel safe to do so where they won't be uh, attacked or even judged by you know members of their own side who say well how could you be fraternizing with mm -hmm. the enemy yeah um it's hard you you talked about it earlier and i thought it was a great point um about how kind of the sides have reached a, a like tribal sense and i think that rings the most true for young people um young people really want to feel like they belong uh, and more and more, you're seeing young people find their identity, not in where our older generations may have found it, which is in a specific religion or in your career path or whatever, but they're trying to find their identity um, in themselves and as they stand within their peers. Um, and that's why politics are so hard to talk about for youth and why colleges are so polarized is because you're not talking politics, you're talking somebody's identity. You're talking about, um, you know, what they consider makes them an individual. Uh, and so I think what Braver Angels needs to do, um, I think it's absolutely possible to connect with college campuses. We have a great college debates program that is expanding um, literally by the month. Uh, and, you know, I think the debates program will really be working with college debates to integrate them into a more national level next year, um, or kind of this year, which I'm really excited about. Um, but the first thing that Braver Angels will have to do is kind of teach young people or get young people to a point where they uh, feel comfortable debating these issues. I think it goes back to our truth and, you know, perspectives conversation of like, your truth is this, my truth is this. Um, when those truths are wrapped up in your identity and you know your perceived rights and things like that, it's a really scary feeling. Um, and so I think Braver Angel's first step is kind of untangling some of the fear around having conversations about identity um, and kind of helping young people navigate um, 
political conversations as it relates to identity and as it relates to economic systems. You know, there's, there's things on either end. Um, it's just about teaching us that we can have those conversations without dehumanizing or disrespecting anyone else in the room. Hmm. I wanted to also ask about the summer of 2020, the killing of George Floyd and all of the widespread protests that followed. I can say among my social network, which definitely leans liberal, that was a really activating and frankly polarizing moment for people where they felt like they needed to pick a side and stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and the protests and people who weren't willing to do that were worthy of shame and opprobrium and canceling and calling out. I wonder, how did you process that summer? And how did that play out on Biola, where obviously a lot of the students lean more conservative? Yeah, um, I was living with my grandparents at the time. Um, I was doing their grocery shopping for them. It was the peak of the pandemic and I had just been kicked off of campus. Um, we all were, I wasn't like, <laughs> you know, removed individually. Um, and, uh, we couldn't talk about it in the house. We tried and I ended up crying. My grandpa was yelling. Uh, it, it stayed in my room and on my phone. Um, and, uh, I lost a lot of followers from like I posted a couple things on social media um and a lot of Biola people either blocked me or removed me from their followers or responded and said um it like in in response to some of the riots and protests um they would kind of swipe up and try and fight me on it and things like that um uh so I I lost a lot of my social network uh at Biola from the things that I was posting um, and being super active about, you know, in the social media sphere. Um, it was very interesting because the school itself, I mean, there, I like to think, I would hope um, that it's pretty, uh, you know, assumed across the board uh, that the mur it was a murder, it was unjust. Um, and Viola came out and said that is they were like the murder of, that was a murder of George Floyd. That was a sign of injustice. They didn't talk about systemic racism. They didn't talk about police brutality. Um, they had some professors from kind of both sides of the issue, write Some like op-eds and things like that, that were published, but the school itself was very much like, uh, I think their, their biggest move was to separate the, the words black lives matter from the movement. Uh, and that was a very, <laughs> that was a clear line that they drew in the sand and they reiterated over and over and over and over again. Um, and they still got people mad at them for even saying the phrase Black Lives Matter. Uh, so Viola did end up taking an objective stance in, in some sense, um, but most of the student body fell on a different side. Hmm. And is there a significant black population in the student body or is it 75 percent white i'm pretty sure gotcha yeah it's so interesting what you mentioned about your experiences with your own social network um because there's such a mirroring that i think was happening with a lot of uh left leaning leaning people where not even people voicing conservative opinions but people you know saying like you know, well, hold on a second. Uh, you know, I I support the movement, but I don't support rioting and burning yeah. police cars. And they just got attacked and mm -hmm. people got defriended and it's quite sad. And I wonder if and how we can reach <laughs> some of the most polarize people mm -hmm. because I think oftentimes the folks who are drawn to braver angels are people who are already curious about the other yeah. side they might not necessarily be center left or center right in their positions but we really do want to reach some of these most 
disaffected communities. And I think the college debates program is a start because yes, it will attract students who are curious and open-minded, but I think it'll also attract polarized people who really want to come and make their voice heard. Yeah. And the say, people you know, who were like me and like to argue and win. Yeah. And, and here's what I believe. And then through getting in the door that way, they can actually start to have a more nuanced understanding of mm-hmm. people that they might have seen in a more flattened manner as, you know, boogeyman and uh, the, the people just who are completely anathema to their identity and their ideology. Mm-hmm. The last thing I guess we could just talk about a little bit because it's sort of interesting is just the current political landscape and where things go from here. My sense is things are going to get worse before they get better. And I think that we're in for a real roller coaster ride over the next few years, starting with the midterm elections and mm-hmm. then in 2024, particularly if Trump wins or runs. Who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> How do you see things playing out? What are your hopes and fears? Um, I mean, I definitely agree in a sense that uh, I think things will get worse before they get better. Um, I think, I think people are just radicalizing themselves and it's like a little scary to me. Um, You know, I was just reading, there was that Canadian like professor, political scientist who just had that big essay about um, how he fears that uh, American democracy will be in the waters by 2025 alongside California, maybe. Um, so there are, you know, just, uh, it's, it's hard because I think that's one of the reasons that um, like cancel culture became really prevalent in the past couple of years is because people in America feel really, really, really out of control with where their country is headed. And that's why you have people hitting those more radical ideas, I think is because those are bigger moves that might give you um, you know, bigger changes that will make you feel more in control and more established of what has happened. The, they feel really out of control and cancel culture got so popular because it was a way for young people to take control is they're the only ones on social media and they're the ones creating these big waves in, in media and things like that. Um, and so, you know, a part of me is nervous that that's just gonna kind of keep growing um, is, you know, the attacks on individuals because we feel so out of control systemically. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, the point about control and one that I hadn't thought about too much. I wonder too, do you think that people who are coming of age in this moment, college students, high school students, middle school students, where this is just sort of the the normal of how our politics and culture operates in addition to radicalizing people do you think it's also breeding cynicism and uh the belief that a lot of people are just like politics is totally broken i'm gonna focus on my friends and Mm -hmm. my social media and my interests but there's really no hope for politics and I'd rather just stay out of it. Yeah, I mean, this is the generation that has never known a world without 9-11, you know? And we all watched our parents go through the 2008 recession. Like we have felt really hopeless in a lot of those areas since the beginning. Um, And so again, like all we're seeing are the people on the on the radical side because those are the ones that are really passionate you know you're getting more and more people who were moderate and who might flip-flop on a couple different issues feel as though there's not even a place for them in the political scene anymore um so i definitely do think we're seeing a lot of people pull back of if you're not like i know so many people on campus who are extremely conservative and everyone else uh has had a pretty nice life uh, and haven't hasn't thought about politics once. Um, I mean, 
yeah, Biola, there's kind of a push for, for political involvement, for voting. You know, people, people like to say that um, participating in politics is a good way for you to love your neighbor uh, and to love your neighbors across the country and things like that. Um, but more and more people are saying, uh, no, I can, I can love people better outside of politics or politics are, like you said, a hopeless case. And so they don't look to it. Mm. And in terms of the hope that you find at Braver Angels, I think you mentioned being struck by the people you worked with, people who have such different politics and life experiences, but are all committed at a fundamental level to this project of goodwill and understanding. What's been your experience working with your colleagues? Um, it's been really nice. All of my colleagues are, are much older than me, um, which <laughs> is not super surprising uh, given Braver Angels' typical demographics. Um, and we've got, you know, a, a pretty even, well, we're a little bit tilted in the blue, but we do a really good job of, at least in debate meetings, um, having red and blue voices there. And it's just, I don't, um, like, when we're making decisions about debates and things like that, we take the time to hear, you know, to do like split votes and things like that, and everyone's picking a resolution or whatever. And we pay attention to uh, not only every person's individual vote, but where more of the reds were and where more of the blues were. Little considerations like that, um, like made me kind of step back and think about what are the different ways like groups are, are kind of um, separated that we don't think about in day-to-day -day life. And so that was one thing was just like practices and meetings and things like that, that, um, you know, kind of brought awareness to uh, some considerations I don't always take into play. Um, but I think uh, one experience, and I talked about this in the newsletter that I wrote like so many months ago, um, was I worked directly under April. Um, April Lawson is managing director. So she's been featured on this podcast many a time. Uh, um, she's a red. Uh, and a pretty, pretty darn conservative red in a lot of areas. Um, but I didn't know that about her until maybe like a month or so in. So I really liked her. I was like, she's so kind and smart and she's running all of these meetings great. She's so professional and responsible. She's a red, are you joking? Um, but it, it, it really did kind of hearing that she was a red, um, I also, you know, had had some experiences with other Reds on the team. You mentioned David Iwinski. Um, I know him as D Wink, um, and he's one of my favorites on the debate team. And I've seen his poodles and, you know, just like if I had watched that podcast or listened to that podcast without having, ha having ever met him, I pr probably would not like him. Uh, but I, I know D Wink um, and I, I like D Wink. And so I know how to have a relationship with him and I'm excited to see him and talk to him in meetings even though he's an anti-vax Trump supporting red, you know? Hmm. Yeah, totally. I've had that same experience too. And I think Brave Angels does really attract a special group of people who vehemently disagree on a lot of core issues, but remain friends, still have a baseline level of admiration and mm -hmm. respect for each other. Yeah, respect despite despite all of that. So yeah, I think that's a good place to end. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. I think that you can be a real leader for Braver Angels within not just your age cohort and the people you've worked with before, but just the broader Braver Angels community. I think you have a great voice and just excited for you to develop that and write and talk and build relationships and to work with you about how we can spread the word and get more people of all ages and all backgrounds exposed to this work and to begin to experience some of the transformation that I know both you and I have experienced through Braver yeah. Angels. So thank you so much. I'm sure this won't be the last time you come on the podcast, <laughs> oh, but I, I really uh, appreciate your time. So thanks again. 
Thank you so much for having me. I, uh, I hope I, you know, was a, was a good guest for only 20 years of age. You were a fantastic <laughs> guest. And I would say to our audiences, would love to know what you thought of this episode. Please like and subscribe and send in feedback to media at braverangels.org, including compliments, criticisms, questions, suggestions for future guests. We are interested in what you have to say. So with that, I thank Esther and we will see you next time.